The Senate has approved financial and administrative autonomy for local governments in Nigeria. The approval was given during a clause-by-clause -clause to some sections of the 1999 Constitution. Erosa Egumbo reports. The committee articulated the review agenda around certain thematic areas including gender equity, federalism and devolution of powers, local government autonomy, public revenue, fiscal federalism, revenue allocation, social, economic and cultural rights, and strengthening the independence of oversight institutions created by the Constitution in line with the bills referred to us. Granting complete autonomy to local governments is part of a major push to improve development at the grassroots. This has been a major challenge for the third-tier government, partly because of poor funding and the overbearing attitude of state governors. The bill was passed along with over 40 others, themed along four key areas, including independence for the State Houses of Assembly and Judiciary, reforms in the judicial sector, national security and electoral matters. An approval was given for financial independence for the State Houses of Assembly and the Judiciary to set them free from the control of their state governors. The Senate passed the bill for independent candidacy during elections, but it was quick to reject attempts to stop defections from political parties. Presiding officers of the legislature were voted to become members of the National Security Council. The pass to summon the president and governors by lawmakers was also approved. The Senate also passed the bill to separate the office of the Attorney General of the Federation from the Minister of Justice. Votes, however, did not pull through for bills to override the president's veto, both for constitutional amendments and other executive bills. Voting for Nigerians in the diaspora also failed. The Senate also rejected the bill seeking to move value-added tax to the exclusive list, a key issue that has been a subject of controversy between states and federal governments. It also rejected calls for revenue courts. Uh, there are some people that wanted, uh, uh, you know, you can talk about VAT or certain things, you know, uh, which maybe some will have worried, maybe a people of some people may have wished that had passed, but obviously uh, it never did, and uh, and just have to uh, respect uh, the rule, the rule of the majority. All gender bills presented failed despite a last-minute campaign by women groups at the National Assembly. A vote for women is a win for Nigeria. Can anybody deny his mother? No. Can anybody abandon his mother? No. Can anybody deny the special role of women in Nigeria? No. Enough is enough. In all, 68 clauses were voted for. Now it's expected to be sent to the states, where two-thirds of the vote will be required by the State Houses of Assembly. Erusa, Igumbo, Arise News. Also in our late night bulletin, Arise News spoke to Senator Mohammed Sani Musa, a Benjamin Kalu spokesman of the House of Representatives. What we did today, I think it's uh, aligned to getting our, 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 our books, especially the Constitution, going in line with uh, other laws that are governing our democratic uh, dispensation here. And when you are talking about immunity, right. <clears throat> immunity for the judicial and uh, legislative, uh, you can see at the National Assembly we didn't uh, uh, actually accept that because we feel everyone should be accountable to his own actions. Uh, it is not wise because the executive who perform most of the implementations of government policies to be, I mean, when you give the head of the executive uh, uh, immunity, actually you tend to protect that person from uh, kind of uh, uh, people taking advantage, going to court all the time, uh, disorganizing that person. But uh, when you are talking of legislative chamber where people are free to come and uh, say whatever their constituent feel is right, uh, you might have a presiding officer that you feel uh, uh, he has done something very wrong outside and then you believe he should be protected because uh, uh, some of these things are the things that we considered and we okay. feel uh, it's, it's better we don't give that 
The issue of independent candidates, it wasn't only the um, Senate that passed it. We also passed it. And um, the beauty of that is that most people who have been sitting on the fence without engaging in this participatory democracy will not have any excuse now, which previously was on the fact that the political parties were not properly managed uh, you know, to accommodate their own philosophy on um, governance or politics. And some of them felt that joining a political party means you must have a godfather. And uh, they don't want to subscribe to that. So they are independent-minded, but they believe that they are popular. So what we are doing now is opening up the space for those who feel, I have something to offer and I have people to back me up to enable me offer that. I don't need a political party platform to get that done. So Nigerians are saying, okay, open up the space for such people. Let them come on board. Uh, although not, that is not without preconditions uh, so that every Dick, Tom and Harry will not jump into the space and increase the cost of uh, uh, politics, you know, or elections. So, um, but it's, it's, it's a good day for Nigeria and, and our democracy that Independent candidacy is now there, and uh, you know what it's going to do? Mm -hmm. It's going to strengthen the management of various political parties uh, so that uh, they value the people they have, because oftentimes we have people who are credible, people who have the competence and the capacity to deliver service being thrown away from the scene because maybe you don't like the pancake on their face, or you feel that their trouser was too long, <laughs> not because they don't have the merit to get the job done. So now you believe... If you kick them out, the public yeah. is going to give them a platform that is not having any political party okay. uh, color. A lot to unpack. <laughs> An awful lot to unpack. Oh, well, yeah, I'll start with where um, Honorable Kalu left it about the independent candidacy that's now been recognized by the Constitution, and I do agree with him. Yes. It's a great move. And also, we have seen Executive Order 10, President Buhari's Executive Order 10, being you know, completely struck down by the Supreme Court, and rightly so. The president's heart might have been in the right place, but that is not how to achieve a constitutional amendment. Now we, ha we have seen how to achieve mm. a constitutional amendment, but it's only half the battle. Mm. I worry about state governors possibly influencing their state houses of legislature, because that's the next thing. Mm -hmm. All the state houses of legislature in Nigeria have to have a two-thirds majority to effect a constitutional amendment, and I worry about that. But I'm not, I'm, I'm hopeful. I think it's the job of the public and the media to put pressure mm. on the members of state houses of assembly to really strengthen the local government. We must have three tiers of government, yes. as was envisaged by the Constitution. It's one of the few things about the Constitution that I actually approve of. Mm -hmm. So I think that the public, we have to make these demands. The media has to make these demands. We cannot continue to have local governments you know, beholden to whims and caprices of governors. And yes, this whole constitutional amendment um, situation falls far short of my personal preference, which would just be to bend the entire unitary contraption and start again. But if it's about piecemeal sort of incremental improvements, if that's what's on offer, then I'll take it. It's better than nothing. There's a lot that has been done now that's really you know, commendable, like separating the office of Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Oh, yes. Finally, we've had movement, we've had traction, and I'm sure you have the whole list and you want to go into it, but I have to say that I think it's a disgrace in this country that all the bills that were you know, targeted at affirmative action for women, better representation of women, which make up half the population and hold up half the sky, were shot down in flames. That's a complete disgrace, but we'll be discussing that later. I mean, it's a reflection of the fact that there's still a hot pill battle for women in this country. And that has come to stare at us in the face. It is sad what I saw yesterday at the National Assembly members, the bill that concerns women was struck aside. And that's why I say, apart from, and I'm really excited for the first time, we've got electronic voting to be able to ascertain the number. It wasn't just a voice vote thing. But apart from that, please, it is time in this country we need to start releasing the names of lawmakers and how they voted. The speaker said he would, actually. Yes. So let us release that name. Let us see how everybody voted. Because for a very long time in Nigeria, lawmakers don't have voting history. And that is what you judge them by. Let's see their views on topical issues. 
Some things I will say are quick gains in all of this will be about railway, getting off that ex exclusive list, putting it back to concurrent list, which they voted in favor. I'm really excited about it because you need the subnationals to be able to develop this infrastructure across board. And if they bring their investment in and they put their resource into this and they can regulate it, then we can go one step further to ensuring that we have rapid development. So I'm sure some state governments now will well on want to do railway. Because when you look at it historically, it has always been the case. It is regions that did railway in this country. So I'm excited about that. Even if we can't totally bend the constitution now, like they argued in this, at least piecemeal we can look at it. Another one that I would have loved to really go to the subnational was the case of VAT. But I don't want to expatiate more on that because there's already a case in court. River state governments and the federal governments in and court Lagos. and Lagos. I know we'll look at them from time to time, but another one I'm really excited about is the one you talked about. Office of the Attorney General and Minister of Justice. We went through hell. We have gone through hell. Where should we start from? From the time of Anduaka to this time? I'm excited that has been sorted out. Because of the want of time, I know in the further conversation we will extract them one by one. But Dr. Abati, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the room to, you know, to comment on this. But some quick wins. Some quick wins. Okay. Mm. Now, if you look at this process, this is the fifth alteration of the uh, Constitution since 1999. And the uh, lawmakers, uh, both chambers of the National Assembly, uh, holding plenary almost simultaneously, considered 68 clauses. They considered five issues, five clauses dealing with federalism. How did they succeed in that regard? Uh, well, with regard to the bill for local government uh, you know, legislative autonomy, they asked for the abrogation of the joint uh, local government and state government uh, joint account under which, you know, state governments have been cheating uh, the local councils. Uh, they also argued and passed the bill with regard to the financial independence of state houses of assembly and the state judiciary. Now, on the question of a federal revenue court and revenue court uh, for the states, they also passed that. They, they could not reach a consensus on the movement of the VAT from the concurrent list to the exclusive legislative list, which is what is before the Supreme Court after the case uh, instituted by uh, uh, the River State uh, Government. And maybe there will be many people who will agree with them. Yes, uh, Bill 51, or if you like, Clause 51, was the one dealing with the separation of the office of the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice. And that has been part of the debate that Attorney Generals of the Federation or Attorney Generals at the state levels tend to behave like politicians because the adjoining title makes them political appointees so they don't have that independence. Now, under that same Clause 51, the uh, National Assembly decided also to make a distinction between the Attorney General, uh, the Accountant General of the Federal Government and the Accountant General of the Federation. And I think that these are uh, important developments. But, okay, on diaspora, diaspora voting, they, they did not agree on diaspora voting. They agreed on independent uh, candidacy. But the more you know, dramatic one is the fact that before this uh, session took place, the First Lady of Nigeria visited the National Assembly. The uh, Second Lady, the wife of the Vice President, also visited the uh, National Assembly along with the Minister of Women Affairs. And they wanted affirmative action for women, which is an issue that would seem to have been resolved in South Africa, in Zambia, in Uganda, in some other African countries. Just ensure that the political representation of women in line with CEDAW protocols, UN protocols, is something that these countries uh, take seriously. But you'll be surprised. The House of Reps voted overwhelmingly against it. The uh, Senate voted overwhelmingly against it. 
But Yabi Amila, in the House of Reps, Speaker of the House of Reps, tried to veto it. And, with, and that was in regard to women representation in cabinet at federal and state levels. Okay, grudgingly, they said, okay, 35% will allow that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, somebody then moved the motion. That it should be re reduced to 20% uh, because we don't want a cabinet that is made up of women. So this is about misogyny. This is about mm. uh, women uh, discrimination against women. Mm. And the point we keep making is about equity. It's about balance in terms of what is uh, you know, projected in terms of uh, gender. Because Section 42 of the Constitution of Nigeria is very clear about the fact that you cannot discriminate against persons on the basis of uh, gender. Now, two issues about railway uh, infrastructure, also about electricity. Uh, they voted to say, yes, states can take charge of electricity, they can take charge of uh, railway. That, again, is within is, uh, the last of the five bills uh, relating to uh, federalism that I talked about. But all of this, in terms of the Constitution amendment process, we still have to go to the houses of assembly mm. in the state. And you must have two-thirds of the state houses of assembly you know, uh, buying into this. So this is just the beginning. We've not seen the end of it. But the larger question is that there are persons who say, for Nigeria to move forward, for us to achieve the objective of restructuring, it's not about tinkering with the Constitution. It's about a wholesale review of this Constitution, which certain forces, certain stakeholders in Nigeria say, you know, it's not a people's constitution. It's not a reflection of the wishes of the Nigerian people. So the politics of it is on another side. The process of it is another subject. But let's see, uh, you know, how all of this will play out in the long run. All right, we'll take a short break. When we return, we'll have Rotu Sadiri, Adeswa Mara, and Aaron Akejala to give us updates on Africa business, COVID-19, and spotting activities across the globe. Stay with us. Very good morning to you. Welcome back. For updates on COVID-19 pandemic, Adeswa Mara is here with us. Adeswa, great to have you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Dr. Batian. Good morning, Chindum. Morning. Good to be here. Well, let's begin with good morning, morning to noon. Uh, let's look at the global statistics according to Johns Hopkins University, as we would normally do. Uh, and a reminder that these are not just figures, these are people, uh, persons that have been affected, communities and businesses, uh, when you begin to break down these numbers in real terms. Uh, we do know there are over 430 million infections so far and at least 5.9 million deaths. A very, we're inching very close to another green milestone uh, for the COVID fatality. Almost 6 million people have been killed so far since this virus emerged and over 10.5 billion vaccine doses have now been administered globally. In Nigeria here in the last 24 hours, 10 new cases were reported. The NCDC says that eight of those cases are a backlog from Edo State in South South Nigeria from the 28th of February. The other two cases came from Cross River State, and there were no COVID-19 related deaths in the past 24 hours. When we look at the vaccination uh, tally so far by the NPHCDA, which is the agency responsible, it says 16% of Nigerians that are targeted for this vaccination have now received one dose of the vaccine. And that's about 17.9 million people. And when you look at those who have been doubly vaccinated, who have received two jabs of the available vaccines, we have 7.6 Nigerians in that category, or 8.1 million people. Remember, Nigeria now has a target to vaccinate 70% of its population by the end of this year. And talking about vaccination targets, well, the World Health Organization says countries are off track in achieving the shared goal of vaccinating that 70% of every country's population by the middle of this year. And this was according to WHO Director Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus. He says, however, that the WHO has now partnered with the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, and Gavi to initiate COVID-19 vaccine delivery partnerships to ensure that these vaccines get to the people. 
And away from that to Hong Kong, as countries are opening up, uh, in a sign that shows perhaps we're returning to normal, uh, this is a reminder that it is not over yet when you look at what's happening in Hong Kong. But facilities for storing dead bodies, or uh, otherwise known as mortuaries, if you want to put it that way, at hospitals and public mortuaries in Hong Kong are at maximum capacity uh, due to a record number of COVID-19 fat fatalities. Uh, the hospital authority said uh, just on Monday that uh, officials are battling to control the surge in cases driven by the Omicron variant of the virus. Of course, uh, Hong Kong at the moment is reported over 30,000 cases daily, and we're seeing deaths in the uh, triple digits at the moment. Uh, 178 uh, deaths were reported on Tuesday. And let's go to the UK where we now have an exact date confirmed for the end of the compulsory vaccines in NHS and care homes. Uh, Health Secretary Sergio Javid had mentioned this a while back. We recall we spoke about this, where he confirmed uh, that the rules making the vaccine a condition of deployment for health workers will be revoked on March 15th. Back to you guys. It's really awful what's happening in Hong Kong, and I do have to say the government has themselves to blame. This backwardness, this lack of trust in the science, the government of Hong Kong was fine with lockdowns and had really strict lockdowns, but I failed to see why government authorities would themselves discredit vaccines and their efficacy and their safety, such that about 50% of over 80s in Hong Kong refuse to get vaccinated because of government propaganda. And those people, many of them are in nursing homes. So when the Omicron variant hit, it just ran through nursing homes like a wildfire. And a lot of people are dying. 91% of the people in Hong Kong who have died, like you said, there's no space in the mortuary. So they've been left in hallways, in hospitals where they've died, just dumped there. Their bodies are just left there. It's awful. 91% of them were unvaccinated. And this is the problem with People not, government officials being reckless in the way they speak. We saw it with um, President Macron of France, and maybe he was peeved about Brexit, attacking the efficacy of AstraZeneca for the elderly, and that caused problems in Europe. This is what happened in Hong Kong. It's really sad. Okay, Hong Kong, 400 deaths per week. It is. Uh, within this week alone, by uh, yesterday, 34,000 plus uh, you know, cases of infection, 87 deaths. And Hong Kong is overwhelmed. The territory has been overtaken by fear and anxiety, even worse uh, than the situation before President Xi Jinping of China moved in. Now, that fear and anxiety has resulted into panic buying. So shelves are empty because everybody is trying to stockpile food. Because the Hong Kong authorities insist on the uh, COVID-0 uh, policy that they have uh, introduced. Policy. By March 9, Hong Kong is introducing compulsory testing three times for nine days uh, for every citizen, population, 7.4 million, okay? So this is the uh, dilemma that they face in Hong Kong, uh, a country that adopted the zero COVID uh, policy and that may be forced with a situation whereby, well, in spite of all these crises, it will still have to uh, review that uh, COVID zero uh, policy as we have seen in Singapore, and as we have seen also in some other parts of uh, the world. But the important thing is that mainland China is moving in, and they are helping them to construct health facilities. And the expectation is that this may help uh, to address the situation. But you know, of course, the COVID-0 uh, policy has been really criticized in the Western media as not necessarily you know, uh, the solution. So, you find a situation whereby in Hong Kong, as other parts of the world, like Britain, like Denmark, like the Netherlands, are uh, opening up Australia uh, inclusive. You find a country where, you know, a territory where more is being done to just shut people down. Two households uh, cannot even meet as, uh, as we speak. But we see how that plays out. The major issue is the Omicron variant. And the uh, incidents that have been reported have been more impactful among the unvaccinated. And many of these unvaccinated persons are persons in the 50, in the 50 year old uh, and above uh, range. Now the uh, WHO Director General says the world cannot meet 
the 70% uh, vaccination rate that had been predicted. And all of those issues are foreseeable. They are understandable. You know, and he made a point that the G7, the G20 countries, we just have to meet their commitments in terms of financing. There is a financing gap of uh, about $16 billion, making it very difficult for, you know, the, uh, the uh, WHO uh, to achieve its objectives under the ACT Accelerator Program. And the uh, uh, Director General singled out South Africa and Norway as two countries, you know, that have been trying to meet uh, their commitments. So there is a funding gap. Beyond the funding gap, there is also uh, problems of capacity with regard to, you know, uh, testing, with treatment, with facilitation, and two countries singled out in Africa as having made an effort, you know, uh, Kenya and uh, Rwanda, Rwanda understandably. But the bigger point is about equitable access to the vaccine. That in itself remains a, a problem. But it's good that we have the WHO uh, giving us uh, these updates uh, on a regular basis. Okay? And then Britain, of course, says it has revoked okay. mandatory uh, COVID shots for health workers. All of that is in line with the uh, living with COVID policy that was announced by the uh, Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister saying that, look, this is about business. We have to get back to our normal lives. And you know that health workers were particularly affected. But the NHS itself is overstretched. There are issues, you know, in terms of the capacity of the NHS uh, to deliver services. Mm -hmm. But you see many of these countries, you know, relaxing the measures, including the U.S., where White House uh, staff now uh, don't have to use uh, masks uh, mandatorily. So <clears throat> I'll start with the NHS. So what happened with the NHS? There was a big pushback in England. And the pushback was, you need this NHS staff, NHS of a stretch. Most of them died as a result of the pandemic. And now you're saying if they don't take vaccines, then nothing will happen. And the public argument in England was the fact that, but these same people you say you're going to sack, you clapped for them. People came out to the streets to clap for them every night. So when are you going to meet them halfway? And that was what nullified the argument of the government in here. That's that about the NHS. Secondly, as regards the uh, Tedros Ghebreyesus speaking, the truth has to be said at this one. The West has vaccinated the people it wants to vaccinate. They are not going to make any more major investment in COVID. As far as they're concerned, they've moved off COVID. 11th of February, they, they took away the need to test when you get into the UK. Mask mandate taking off. They've moved off COVID. They're going to treat COVID just like another flu. They have enough vaccination and they don't care about us in this part of the world. But what they should remember is look at cases like Hong Kong. We could have a resurgence because of the areas you leave behind. But that's the way of the world. And that's why we keep calling exactly. on African leaders. Develop your own continent. Get capital injection to fund medicine, to fund science, to do the needful. The money you go keep in Swiss bank accounts, if you use that to develop your healthcare sector, you will not have to depend on the West. Because as far as I'm concerned, and look at it, we have a 16 billion shortfall. Who's going to pay the money? Nobody in the West is going to put that money down. They've moved on. Look at the percentage of their population that's been vaccinated. You want to compare vis-a-vis -vis Nigeria? The UK has gotten well over 50% vaccination. America too has gotten the same, and the numbers keep increasing by the day. So as far as they're concerned, they've moved off to you. They've moved off all of us. This is the time for us to introspect. But the sad reality is we are not learning. Because I thought that COVID was going to be a big turning point. But we haven't learned anything. Have we developed the infrastructure? No. It's still holding talks, like Olarutimi will say. Thirdly, it shows to a large extent, for all the naysayers, for all the doubters, for all the anti-vaxxers, that there's empirical evidence that vaccines do work. And if you're looking for an answer, Hong Kong is your answer. Because Hong Kong didn't vaccinate, you're seeing the after effect of not supporting the vaccination drive. And that's why, please, go out there, get vaccinated. And please, African leaders, do the very best for your people. Because the West has left us behind. They're talking about a Russia and Ukraine. They're not talking about COVID again. Thanks, Adiso.
Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Nigerian women have vowed to occupy the National Assembly beginning at 8 a.m. today until all gender bills in the Constitution Amendment exercise are reconsidered. The women are presently at the National Assembly to commence their protests. We are now joined by Arise correspondent Georgina Ndukwe for more on this developing story. Good morning, Georgina. Good morning. Can you give us an update on what's happening out there, the Nigerian women occupying the National Assembly? Who are those Nigerian women, just individuals or members of particular organizations or a bit of both? Great Nigerian women. All right, so we have about 230 pro-women groups, civil society groups, seated here or gathered here at the front of the National Assembly demanding that the lawmakers revisit the gender bills that were rejected uh, during plenary or during the consideration of the Constitution uh, review uh, yesterday. We have members of the civil society groups, like I mentioned earlier. We have pro-women groups here, and they are saying they are not going to leave the front of the National Assembly until the, the President of the Senate comes to address them and let them understand why the gender bills were rejected on the floor of the Senate and the House of Representatives yesterday. Well, is it possible for you to talk to any of the leaders of the uh, protest? Because we also discussed the matter this morning, and we thought the rejection of affirmative yes, action Yes, it is for possible. I will um, to try to approach someone now. Yes, please. Well, we have someone here who has been very vocal when it comes to the issues of women. Um, she is Chioma, and like um, Chioma. Yes. Uh, she will give us an update, you know, break down what exactly the women are asking for. Um, good morning, uh, morning. Chioma. Sorry, uh, just give us your full names first of all. My name is Chioma Agwebo. I'm the executive director at Tech ING. All right, so what are the women demanding for? We're saying that we're tired of negotiating our identity as Nigerians. We're saying we want to be full citizens of Nigeria. We're saying that we want to be able to confer citizenship on the men that we marry who are not Nigerian. We're saying that we're not only asking for affirmative action, right? So um, for women to become, for women to have the opportunity for executive positions within political parties. We're saying that we don't want 10% of appointed positions. We're saying that we're 50% of the population and that you cannot lead us without us. Right? Ultimately, we're saying that in 2022, we're tired of negotiating our identity as full citizens of Nigeria. That's what we're saying today. So beyond this now, what will be the next step? We have decided to not to leave the front of the National Assembly. What if the Senate President or any official, principal officer of the National Assembly do not, you know, um, agree to come speak with the group? I think that, first of all, it will be absolutely shameful for them to not come out to speak to the people that they represent, and we're hoping that they do not do that. However, the same way we have people here, we also have people who are engaging you know, through back channels. We're also going to be engaging the government in every way possible, whether it's through civil society, whether it's through citizens, whether it's through international organizations, whether it's through development partners, because the truth is, it's actually quite shameful, right? I'm not sure if people recognize how shameful it is that in 2021, all we're saying is we want to be full citizens, right? We have the worst representation of women in politics in leadership positions, and that's not what it should be. Why are women good for their votes, but they're not good for leadership positions? Why are we good for votes? Why are we good for crowds, but we're not good to say what it is that we want as citizens of Nigeria? So we, we plan to play the long game. We don't have four years, right? Development cannot wait. Equality cannot wait. Progress cannot wait. And that's what we're saying here today. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, they, they... You heard it from her. She's saying that they are determined to play the long game and keep insisting until the demands of Nigerian women are considered and uh, they, they included in the constitution okay. and passed into law okay. and assented to by the president. Georgina, if you can hear me, I'd like to ask, is there anybody, any member, you know, or, or representative or the spokesperson of the National Assembly come out to speak to them? And uh, what has been the reaction, you know, from the part of the lawmakers? 
for now, we have not had any member of the National Assembly or any principal officer of the National Assembly here. Um, they actually spoke with Senator uh, Einaya Baribe um, earlier and he said on the phone that he actually voted for the gender bills and that he will come out and join in the protest. But we are yet to see him. Um, I mean, some members of the uh, National Assembly uh, may be trying to get into the premises. We have not seen anyone for now. There is an alternative route where they can all pass, but we are hoping that one or two members will come and as soon as they come, we will get their reaction. Okay, thank you very much, Georgina. We we'll keep uh, the watching brief on developments at the National Assembly and this struggle for affirmative action uh, for Nigerian women. It's good to see that some men joined the protest, but now we're being joined by our dependable Rotus Adiri with an African business update. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, Fai. Good morning, well, Doctor. You find the uh, women, you will find men. <laughs> <laughs> No, but Doctor, I'll join this protest. <laughs> <Please, laughs> yeah, we should join. Men no, should join. Women yeah, in we, Nigeria had we, male members. Yeah. Uh, I was a member many years back. Ah. So we support women courses. Amen to that. To, uh, yes. Uh, this is a very important <laughs> course. Doctor. Yes. So um, um, at the ongoing fifth international energy uh, summit that's happening in uh, Abuja, um, you've had Huawei come out to say that they've got technology that can hopefully reduce pipeline vandalism. Uh, in Nigeria, you know we've had uh, this is the, the you know the bane of our existence of the oil and gas uh, industry, where pipeline vandalism, according to the this day newspaper investigation, I think suggested about twenty nine billion dollars has been lost over the past six years. So they're saying they've got some at the summit they've got some tech. Here's a quote from uh, I think it's Lee Wai. He's uh, the um, head of uh, Huawei uh, business interests here, uh, Nigeria Business Enterprise, uh, Enter Nigeria Enterprise Business or director of Huawei Nigeria Enterprise Business. Lee Wai says Huawei has developed fiber vibration intrusion warning system that uses artificial intelligence to identify intrusion scenarios accurately. So basically when pipes get burst. With high identification precision, accurate positioning and quick response, it will help to ensure pipeline safety and reduce theft and vandalism. So that's what they are um, offering to put forward to use. And you know, we've talked a lot about how technology can help to reduce uh, a number of issues from, you know, Governor Arufai saying it can reduce terrorism with drones to, you know, tra you know, tracking in other sectors and so on and so forth. So with what, you know, if you think about what's been, how our production has been impacted and how we're not um, profiting from higher oil prices, this is something that definitely needs to be addressed. Will it be adopted? It remains to be seen. Now we're going to jump into earnings um, for a number of companies across four different sectors, starting with the uh, financial sector. Zenith Bank uh, grew their profits by double digits across uh, a number of sectors. If you take a look at the at the numbers here, um, their gross earnings, I think, were up about 10% to 765 uh, billion naira year on year. Profit after tax, 6% growth, 245 uh, billion naira for profit after tax. Their customer deposits, 21% growth. Um, I believe their assets now up to 9.4 trillion naira. I mean, that's a big 21% jump in their customer deposits. Uh, that's their assets at the bottom uh, of the screen there. Income from commission and fees, 31% increase. Net interest income, I think, is 7% increase to 320 billion naira. The, the, the bank really performed pretty well for full year 2021. Stock price now is at 27 naira. Uh, so far this year, it's up 8%. And I believe the dividend they announced, a 2 naira 80 corporate dividend, gives a dividend yield of about 10%. So you take your capital appreciation where the stock is up 8% plus a dividend yield of 10%. As we talk right now, that gives you an 18% return on Zenith Bank, which is above uh, inflation. We move to Dangote Cement. Dangote Cement also um, recording some pretty robust figures um, for the full year 2021 uh, period. Also, if you pull off those numbers for uh, Dangote Cement, You'll see that their revenues, I think it was 1.38 uh, trillion naira in revenues, a 33% uh, jump. Nigeria's domestic sales, 956 billion, accounted for about 70% of the figure that you're looking at for revenue. So domestic sales of 956 billion, export sales of 36 billion naira. 
You add that together, and I mean, it's it, the bulk of revenue came from Nigeria. Profit total tax five hundred eighty-three billion, forty-four percent jump. Profit after tax a thirty-two percent jump. If you're wondering why that is, cement prices have grown what seventy-three percent from about two thousand six hundred naira to start twenty twenty-one to about four thousand five hundred to end twenty twenty-one. So cement prices and the increase we've seen in the cement prices are a big reason for uh, the robust profits uh, that Dangote Cements reported. They're also a dividend of, I think, 20 naira is the dividend that the company announced, which is 25% higher than what was um, paid out last year. The stock is up 6% so far this year. So 6% plus the dividend yield of 7.3%. That's not quite at inflation, but it's still pretty robust. So that's Dangote Cement. So that's uh, industrials. Seplat, we just talked about oil and gas and vandalism. Seplat also reported their earnings uh, as well. Seplat Energy PLC. Uh, if you take a look at their numbers, if we pull those numbers up as well, this was pretty much a story of a rebound in oil prices. Seprat's revenue, 84% of their revenues come from crude oil sales, which should be a microcosm of Nigeria. If a publicly traded company that depends so much on crude oil can report numbers like this, <laughs> and yet the country in which the company is located <laughs> cannot get benefit from oil, it's ah. <laughs> but anyway, so revenue, $733 million. They report their earnings in dollars. 38% jump. Um, now, the EBITDA is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and, uh, and amortization. amortization. So adjusted EBITDA, $372 million, 40% jump. This is the key, that third line, realized oil price, $70.50 per, per barrel for, that is average for 2021. That was 39 or $38 in 2020. So the per profits that they've realized from higher oil prices, 77% jump. Profit below tax, $177 million. They recorded a loss in 2020, remember, you know, with COVID and what it did to oil prices. So very, very healthy there. I think Seplat's um, dividends about $14 million that they're going to be paying out. Seplat's stock, I told you last year, it was about 60%. It ended up, ended up about 73%. As we speak, Seplat's stock is up 45% this year. It is, it's... It's eye it's, it's eye popping, right? Mm -hmm. um, finally, Transcorp hotels. Uh, we go to um, um, uh, hospitalities. Um, Transcorp hotels. They also swung from a loss in 2020 to profits um, in 2021. So pull up their uh, numbers as well for Transcorp hotels. 21 billion naira in revenue, 114 percent jump. Gross profits. You know, subtract your cost of goods, uh, uh, cost of sales from your revenue. Gross profits, 16.2 billion. 143% uh, jump. Profit before tax, look at 1.6 billion. It was an 8.9 billion Naira loss in 2020. Profit after tax, 1.1 billion, 6.2 billion um, Naira loss. You take all these together, Zenith in banking, Dangote Cement in industrials, Seplat in oil and gas, Transcorp in hospitalities, it's a recovery. You're seeing companies, especially for Seplat and Transcorp, bouncing back from the impact of COVID. And now there's something that I really want to stress here about the capital markets and wealth creation. People need to invest more in the Nigerian stock exchange because you are literally, when you look at where these stocks are in the different sectors from financial services to industrials to hospitalities to oil and gas, for select players, for the bigger blue chip companies, more folks should be putting their money in the exchange. Now I'm not saying putting all of it because stock markets go up and down, but over a long period of time, you do get an appreciation when you add your dividend yields that the companies are paying plus what the companies, uh, what the cost appreciation in the stock. So ladies and gentlemen, where are you putting your money? I mean, this, what is today? March 2nd, salaries have been paid across a number of com companies in, in, in the country. You need to take a small portion of your earnings and put them into the market on a gradual basis. You will see the appreciation over time. Thank it's you really for that, Roger. It's, it's real. Especially with um, inflation, it's something right. mm. that's worth considering. But regarding Huawei, I mean, I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble, right. but we do have quite a self-defeating sort of short-sighted culture in this country. And no matter how good your tech is, I mean, the tech will alert you, the AI will alert you. It's going to be a person <laughs> that's going to respond to that alert. That is true. And if that, that person true. has that malaise, you know, that I referred to earlier, then what happens? This right. is the issue. It's so the culture. <laughs> human, the human elements, yes. the Eto in uh, the ports. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Look so, at what happened so, with Eto. Root, right. So it's the corruption and theft in human beings right. that has not made anything 
tech work in this country when it comes to government. True. Even if Huawei installs the best technology, it will not still work because people are thieves. Some people. Uh, some people are thieves. Are we going to say we don't know that there are solutions to these problems all this while? Right. We know. Is it technology that is going to help us account for how many liters of crude are we even consuming in the first place in this country? It's just because we know people are corrupt. And the question I keep asking is, why do you keep stealing the country blind? Mm. Why? Haven't people stolen enough? When are they going to have pity on this country? But in all of this, Nigeria is not a hopeless case. And I'm sure this reports show the rebound. I dare most blue chip companies to rebound this way mm. in other parts of the world. Right. It shows that this country is blessed, that despite all the shocks of COVID and everything, this country starts to rebound, companies start to do well again. And this is apart from the, text, uh, from the stocks of telecoms company. Right, right. When those right. ones come in, right, yeah. it's going to be a big victory lap. Yeah. This is the only country that year on year, you can get more than 20% return on investment. It is a good economy. It's a good country. We just need Nigerians to come together and make it work and stop stealing this country dry. Excellent this country point. is blessed. I see opportunities. There's mining. still a lot of green mining. field opportunities <laughs> I everywhere. Yep, yep. Okay. If we can dial back very quickly. Yes. On the issue of uh, who are we uh, saying that they've come up with technology that will check oil theft. Oil theft is a major problem in Nigeria. Pipeline vandalism is a major problem. Nati, in 2019, said we were losing about uh, 200,000 barrels per day. In 2021, the Nati report indicated that Nigeria loses, within a year, up to about $42 billion from uh, oil theft and oil uh, pipeline vandalism. This has also become a major issue this year. Because if you look at the figures provided by the Nigerian Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, that figure, let's just take $42 billion that I mentioned. It can solve a lot of problems mm, yeah. in this country. So there is heavy economic sabotage in that regard. But why are we saying, oh, we'll come up with a technology that will solve the problem? This is not the first time we're hearing this. Right. You recall that sometime uh, early last year, uh, there was this talk by NMPC about technology to monitor processes in the downstream sector. What happened? using technology to monitor uh, sale of uh, fuel and all of that, nothing came out of it. Mm. And I think it's in that regard that beyond technology, the human beings are the problems. Mm. Look at how the uh, uh, midstream and downstream regulatory authority that replaced the DPR dropped the ball. Right. Even with regard to uh, just checking for methanol, they did not do it. That, that one is even something as simple as you can imagine, right. but they couldn't do it. As for the companies making big money, even under COVID, in 2020, at the height of uh, the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, there were some sectors that were doing well. Yep. Okay, telecom, yep. the banks, they did well uh, naturally. You know, oil and gas at some point did well until it was affected. So there will always be some of these companies doing well. And their shareholders are the direct beneficiaries. Transcorp is going to pay uh, 70 couple. Right? Seven couple, seven 70 couple, couple yeah. dividend. Uh, Dangote is going to pay uh, 20 naira to uh, the uh, uh, shareholders. But I think out of all of this, out of all the reports, the one that I find more engaging is the Dangote cement report. Mm. In terms of what the company says it's doing or plans to do with regard to carbon emissions, mm. and the company is saying it's committed you know, to uh, mitigating the effect of uh, carbon uh, emissions, mm. and is committed to transparency and uh, accountability. Okay, this was the same thing that came out from the uh, G7 uh, uh, meeting. Yep. So we shouldn't just be talking about profits. Okay, okay. About true. shareholders lining their pockets. We should be talking about what is it that these companies are giving back. And the only sector that seems not to be making money at all is the media. <laughs> Have you had uh, any media company? We sit down here every morning, we are talking, we are talking, we are talking. Uh, media company, uh, which media company is making money in this economy? There's only one media company that's quoted. Uh, 
Well, only one media company. Has well, voted. is that company making money? Well, what, so to Doctor's point, more like should be quoted. <laughs> more should be quoted on the exchange. Would you like only one media company? <laughs> <That's> a situation <laughs> where media companies also can declare profits. Right. You know, maybe we will do more. We will show a better example in terms of uh, transparency and accountability uh, within the market. But I hope that uh, Dangote Cement is aware that we're calling them out mm. in terms of what they, do, what they intend to do yes. on the corporate social responsibility side and know that we have noted it yes. and we'll be monitoring. <laughs> yes, you know, they're talking about alternative fuel. What kind of alternative fuel mm. are they talking about? Reducing carbon emission. How are they going to go about it? So this thing about... Uh, uh, shares and you are giving investment advice. You should buy your... Go and buy shares. <laughs> Go and buy it. So it's more about the common good <laughs> very true, rather very than true. what comes into our pocket. Very true. Very Thank true. You. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Thank you.